Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, the second session of the 1,000 Plateaus Reading Group, hosted by the New Center for Research and Practice. Uh, my name is Jacob Van Gies, and I am moderating this event. And today we are dealing with the 12th Plateau, the nomadology, um, the, which deals with two major concepts, the war machine and the nomad. Um, and all sorts of different things that interrelate with those concepts. Um, and to sort of get the discussion going, Dave Jonathan has a couple of questions um, that he's going to ask throughout the hour that the session will entail. So Dave, if you want to start with those, or start with one of those. Yeah, and I can kind of just feed these. Um, I would. I don't want to. I don't want by asking questions to kind of dominate the session. I am interested right. to hear people's sort of um, yeah reactions just to the plateau as a, as a whole. But yeah, so uh, I already asked one of them in the in the comments uh, sections. It was an accident actually. I didn't realize it would send. I was trying to drop. You know, I was going to write them all out in advance. But the the trick on Facebook message uh, you know, on Facebook comments where you push shift and you can click enter and then go down the line. Yeah, that doesn't work on uh, Hangouts. So anyway, first question was why did no man's invent the war machine? But I want to add to that. It's not just why did nomads invent the war machine? Why did they, why do, why does it seem like Deleuze and Guattari want this to be the case? Why do they need this to be the case? Why do they find these, why is this useful for developing their other concepts? Why are these useful concepts? That's general and, and broad, but let's go there. Yeah, so why why are these concepts central to them? Or why are they important? Yeah. I'll let somebody else talk first. Spontaneously? <laughs> I'm thinking somehow I go back also to um, the idea of difference and that which is outside of representation and that what is outside of the state they, and they, they, ha they somehow occupy this, this smooth territory but I wouldn't say that and I think it's clear on that too that it's just like it's a function of what they are rather than something they invent it's 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 not something it's not something that they, it's just a description of that which is not the state that's a pure exteriority and that is would be like in a more broader loss in sense would be like the pure difference in some sense but in this time it has this political um labeling as the nomadic that would be my spontaneously thought yeah I think I think central and lurking in the background of this chapter is the image of thought um, that Deleuze talks about in Difference and Repetition. It's brought out pretty explicitly in the section on newology. I'm not exactly sure how they pronounce that. Um, I think that's how it's spelled. Um, that the there's, there's a certain image of thought, and I think a lot of Deleuze's work is trying to think about how to think outside that image of thought. And if the state creates this image of thought, or if the state is sort of behind this image of thought with its representations and the rigidifications or molarizations that it produces, um, then there would have to be something out. I, I think that they're really wanting to think outside, right? Because the state is an interiority. Um, so how, how do we change an interiority? And, and in Spinoza, um, 
uh, into our interiority cannot change itself. It can only be changed by something from the outside. Uh, so I wonder if that is sort of lurking in the background here, that change can only happen from the outside. It can't happen from the interior. Um, and that's part of what is required in the nomad. It's something that is outside of the state apparatus. The question applies to all of you. Jump in, people. I'll, I'll attempt. So uh, I, I think I'm trying to, I, I've thought of the nomad as like a bot, uh, not a body, because that's using, but like it's a, agent of the rhymat uh, of of the rhizome i guess like uh it's it's what are the words the nomads allowing the rhizome to like move through space it's like this it's 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 a it's another degree i guess of that concept of the rhizome um in <laughs> Like the descriptions of its smoothness, of the way that it's moving across things. Like in, in the descriptions, I think of mushrooms and their rhizomes and how they move through like the forest and whatnot. Um, and uh, <sighs> hmm. Yeah, it's it's a really hard one, and, and and part of part of it, I guess, and it's it's kind of my next question too. But maybe you'll want to talk on this. Um, how do you say your name one more time? Hyacinth. 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 Yes. Yeah. I smoothness does seem like a really important factor or, or piece of this, right? And and kind of, I guess I'm having a real difficult time understanding what a smooth space could really be. I get that it's supposed to be exterior to the state, that the state is in the striated space, but I'm like, how could a so, person be in a non-striated space? How would war take place in a non-striated space? So I think we can maybe think about this in terms of geology. Um, so I think it's important when we're, we're reading the Lizzie Guattari, like, when we talk about different things uh, in ways that we you would usually use analogy, I think we can talk about them in terms of uh, univocity, right? So if we talk about geology or if we talk about um, uh, social strata, we're talking about the same sort of phenomenon. These are not analogous to one another. They work in the same way. Um, and I find it really helpful to think about things in terms of geology because it's a lot easier to think about what a smooth space might mean there and how a ridge of, how striations can happen in geology. Um, so if we imagine uh, the formation of a river, um, you imagine uh, there's a bunch of snow on top of a mountain that starts to melt because the world's heating up and so it forms streams. Um, and these streams, I think we can think of in a similar way that uh, class, I think, thinks about uh, the primitive space. Um, these are sort of supple streams. They're very easy, they very easily change course if something affects them, if something gets put in their way that makes them change their course, they're very easy to circumnavigate and make them go in a different pathway. But over time, um, as a matter of intensity, the stream is, whether it, it picks up more water, it picks up more speed, as a result of this intensity, uh, it's going to pick up more and more sediment and cut into the bedrock, right? So this is a form of striation, and I think it's, a, it's similar to the way that the state striates, right? It makes the once supple stream very rigid. Now, 
all the time within that rigid space within the state there's all sorts of molecular actions going on there's all sorts of uh there's sediment that's still being picked off there's deterritorializing of the walls walls of that river by the riverbed um more and more sediments being picked up but these are all relative sort of deterritorializations uh because the overall structure of that stream uh remains the same it, it the, the pathway is not changing to or the river it, the pathway is not changing too much it's going in one direction that's been made rigid by the stratification that's happened as a result of the river cutting into the bedrock now what could we imagine as a smooth space well we could imagine some sort of geological event that cuts into uh the land like an earthquake or something or like a massive rainfall, we can imagine something crazy happening and covering up that lake um, or covering up that river with a lake. Now this to me is to some degree a making of a smooth space. There's a force from the outside, whether that be a massive rainfall, a geological event, um, which to completely deterritorializes this in an absolute deterritorialization because the river is no longer there after this event. Um, it's become a lake or it's, or something else. I don't know what other sort of phenomena could occur, but it, where it becomes something completely different, where that initial river, that initial stratified state space has been attacked by the outside in such a way that completely dismantles it and makes it into something different that there's a smooth space in the, in the lake. Um, so I think, how, how do we think about that in terms of like a social strata? Um, because I, th I think we can think about it through a univocal voice, um, but it, it's a lot more difficult when it comes to social strata. Um, it might be easy to think about how the rigidification happens initially, but what is that line of flight that produces the lake in terms of social strata? And it could be, you know, any number of things we could think about, uh, we could think about it in terms of relative deterritorializations. Um, and I think there's any number of these. Um, and I'm writing a paper right now on this in terms of Christianity, where you see all these sorts of uh, molecular movements going on there in certain churches, there's acceptance of LGBTQ people, there's acceptance of um, things that you wouldn't have accepted in the church 50 years ago, but the structure remains the same. So what would an absolute deterritorialization of that space look like? And there's one obvious thing that's given to us, and that could be a complete negation of that space. Um, and that would, and like, we'll see that that leads to fascism, according to Deleuze and Guattari, that it's just like this absolute dismantling of the entire thing and flattening out the space. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be what they want to do. What they seem to want to do is like a controlled absolute deterritorialization. Um, and I think that we might get more into that in the next plateau, but uh, it's difficult to kind of imagine what this sort of absolute positive deterritorialization would be. And Jason has written upon, upon this. Um, and uh, there, he has a, a interview that he did with Virilio that um, I would highly recommend reading, but it posits a sort of Dionysian yes through Nietzsche, which is a yes that knows how to say no, um, that draws heavily upon the Liz's book on Nietzsche. Uh, but it's sort of an attempt to negate, but negate in a way that is affirming of something beyond. Um, but what I find troubling about this sort of thing is that the critique that you get from, say, Afro-pessimism, which suggests that any sort of affirmation that we make within the state milieu is already doomed to repeat the state. Um, so... Uh, something I find interesting is whether this sort of positive absolute deterritorialization, which they want, they seem to want in this text, whether that is possible. Sorry for that long monologue. I, I can. I was just going to say that makes sense, but um, go for it. I can pick up on that note too, because in this, um, 
categorization that we're working with in this plateau. Uh, you have the nomads and you have, have the state. But that, that's as always, and we will always come back to this theme, that he, he then goes on to show how the, the, what is the nomadic function within the state. And that you can never, it will always be nomadic activity going on inside the state. And there will be this back and forth and that the state will always appropriate this type of behavior. And to, to use the example here, he took, it, it gets very into the, the concept of technologies and, and, and invention that doesn't come from above, but somehow comes from some type of tribal, some type of other thinking going on inside the state. And that's, and that's an affirmative, that's, that's, that's what I think you were saying, that it, when, if, if the nomads are only outside of the state, they don't actually, it just, they just are, are on this smooth plane, but when they get inside the system, then you get new types of effects that you wouldn't have otherwise. So the state needs the nomads in order to to evolve, and that's all. That's a lot of the dialectics that goes on in the text. You you, you see this back and forth uh, between them. Yeah, I can I can continue, but I'll I'll go. Yeah. I wonder, like, I think it's more helpful to discuss like explicit examples that are in the text. Like, I wonder if it would be helpful to talk about the nomad science versus the royal science and, um, I, and how those things intersect I, with one another. And I think that I realized that he has, he has these two examples. And, and the first example is the cathedrals. And it, is, it, it, is very, it took me quite some time to understand, but he sees the cathedrals or the cathedrals builders to be something of a nomadic science. And he gives two examples and he says that uh, both the Romanesque architecture, how uh, Bernard of Clairvaux uh, denies or choose not to use Euclidean geometry, but rather to use a concept of allowing the material to force itself and make structure not based on like, because he said, he said like Bernard of Clairvaux thought this is too complex. Let's just place rock onto each other and make it f and make us feel our way to the to the um, to the structure. And then it takes the, the concept of the, um, the, um, the architect, but it doesn't know, not the architects, but the uh, master mason, I would say, of the Gothic cathedral. And he says that the, the, the mason is drawing out the map on the floor. And this is true. This is how you build cathedrals. That, that they started with a map on the ground. And from this map, something then was created but it was not created on a desk somewhere else. It's not a product that comes from above. It's something that grows within, and they choose to, to use the, um, the, the stone techniques. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but they, they let it grow out of the stone. And somewhere he talks about wood later on, and that you, uh, you are uh, a servant of the wood or servants of the materials. So inside the state, you still have these different options when, when, when facing a material challenge. You can face it like an engineer or you can face it like an, uh, like an uh, nomad. <laughs> or, uh, yeah. So that's, that's, that's one of the main examples that comes here. When, and, and then he says that this is like a problem for the state because it gets different kind of connections because you get like this kind of Freemasonry which is uh, organizations within the states, not controlled by the states. Uh, and then you have to control the Freemasonry inside the state. So, so you get this type of dialectics going on all the time, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it seems like any form of invention is, is the nomadic science because it, it requires this sort of experimentation, whereas the royal science is just about trying to figure things out. Um, is trying to classify them and put them into the taxonomy. Um, whereas the, the nomad science is attempting to let the material flow and see what becomes of it and experiment with different things. 
um, kind of kind of a way I've been thinking about that is that the the nomadic in in the sense of science is probably any any innovation that comes through nomadic science is probably coming as a um, it's it's from the particular. Um, it's 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 uh, involved in a specific kind of activity. Say if some invention is created here, it's created as an answer to something that's in a specific context where it to be plugged in or appropriated by the um, the royal science. It, it it becomes this process of okay, well that's how it was used in this particular, but how would it work in all? Uh, how would it traverse like all particulars, you know, in this domain? Um, and, and something that I'm, that, that has me thinking about it is like, uh, I read James Scott's seeing like a state and I don't know if anyone's here is familiar with James Scott. He also wrote, um, the art of not being governed. Um, and so he's an anarchist anthropologist and the art of not being governed is his, um, field study of the, the hill tribes in uh, like on the kind of periphery of um, the Chinese state and how there are, you know, thousand year um, like legacies of these different nomadic tribes that have lived on the periphery of the state. Um, and so Deleuze and Gotari, they, they pick up on someone else's idea that that a lot of, that, that there's a lot of like uh, okay tribes see the possibility for for becoming a state and actively do things and set up practices to make it so that they won't become a state and 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 at the end and it can be a cultural thing to be averse to to becoming a part of a state um, that is talked about uh, by Adkins in the companion that I'm reading but he doesn't tie it into James Scott. It just seems like James Scott took that thesis and then was like, okay, well, let's see if this is the case in China and wrote the book about it. But in seeing like a state, he talks about the kind of the way that, uh, is it Carolina? At least that's what your, your name here says. So Carolina has been saying um, that the nomad Op th th that someone can act nomadically within the state still, right? And that the state could not run without people doing uh, nomadic things within the state. And um, Scott, James Scott in Seeing Like a State talks about <clears throat> like, he uses a good example of this. He's It's called the uh, hold on Matt, you're making some noise. Let me, let me mute you. Okay, there we go. Um, the uh, sorry that I, I got distracted. Oh, an example of, of, of how we constantly have to kind of uh, do things outside of the protocol established by the state or the institution or constantly do things outside of the established or instituted procedure. Um, the, uh, the perfect example of this is the work to rule strike. Um, and, and one of these happened at Caterpillar, I, I forget which decade, but, um, basically the employees did a work to rule strike, which is where they follow the book by the rule to the letter and they don't do anything extra. And by doing that, the factory shuts down because the Every worker necessarily just to make the damn thing function figures out shortcuts. And there is this sense in which uh, sh short short circuiting various processes is incentivized in capitalism. Um, but it's also like it kind of secretly incentivized because if you were, you know, I mean, we're not going to reward you openly for going for going off the uh, going outside of how we normally would do things, but if you do go outside of how we do things, and then you were to mess up, well, then we let you go. Um, 
the rest of the time, obviously though, there's just like this sense in which you are more competitive than your, the, the employees around you. So, so yeah, it's incentivized, but so, so you, you have to be nomadic within the system, even to make the system function. I'm not sure if this analogy is, is helpful. I'm not, you know, it, in my head, it sounds good, but for anyone who hasn't read that, maybe this just doesn't sound useful. So I'm interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think it's wrong to like dichotomize them. They're always in flux with one another. And uh, right, instead of binaries, it's always ratios with these guys. Yeah, it's always, always degree. Yeah, and you can also see that he does a very beautiful thing. We we, we talked about cathedrals because then he talks about yes, yes, this this is like this nomadic thing. But then he says, well, he names two cathedrals, one in Orléans, I think, and he says these cathedrals fell apart. And he says that, that because you are, the safety part is not being taken care of because you cannot do the back checks, you cannot do the, the quality checks. And therefore the buildings can also collapse. And therefore something else is ne necessary here for the safety. And the safety will, will, will somehow also take over this process because safety is like a higher value than innovation in our societies. So in that case, the, the state goes in and takes the science and makes it safe. And then you have then and then it goes on to the next level and then you find new. So that's that's the dialectics part going on, yeah. I think your your audio is not working. <laughs> and now? Now now it's working. Great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gesticulating on mutely. Uh, but so I was thinking about the the, the the bit that they say about agriculture and um, so like, oh my God, so many notifications. <laughs> um, so th this bit about agriculture, they're talking about rice patties. Um, and I was thinking about the interplay, I guess, between the, the royal science of agriculture and then this minor science of horticulture. Um, like rice patties before we started trading rice and it had to be something that was produced and you know ordered striated i guess into fields rice patties were these just huge terraced things that you could fill with water but rice can't be wet all the time so it has to dry out sometimes but like there was an immense variety in these sort of terrace structures you could have deeper pits where you could grow lotus um, on the side, you could grow sorghum. Like the the rice paddy was not this this monoculture thing where everything is uh, bit by bit and the plants are terribly mutated, whatever else. Um, but uh, of course, that's failed now. But um, there was also a bit where they're talking, I guess, at the beginning about the minor science. Um, about hydraulics um, and my point really isn't about hydraulics but it, it's about like the difference between like the way that we conceive of light Lucy Rigore talks about this and she was shamed to death by Alan Sokol or whatever but um, she criticized Einstein uh, for saying that light was basically this rigid wave or not wave, but a particle that's going in a straight line. And she basically came up with a reason why he got the speed of light wrong, um, because his science is based on the rigidity of it. And 
it, that like the fact that I don't know that the minor science is one of innovation, I guess. I see the minor science is maybe one that allows for uh, like the state maybe to continue. Um, like I think of the difference between Tesla and Edison, like Tesla's mode of conveying electricity or energy to people was sort of like through the air in this, this smooth space where you can draw energy anywhere. Whereas Edison is this very rigid, we have to drill pipelines uh, and not pipelines, but pipes to lay wire or cable. Um, and so it's just this, this very striated thing. Um, and so it, it, it makes me think that, I don't know. I, I think that the minor, minor science is maybe something that can't be captured. Um, like I think about, I was thinking earlier about astrology and astronomy and how astronomy was captured because it's really about the motion of these planets. But that came from astrology, which is this thing that basically says we can predict the future. Um, and therefore we can use auspicious days to take over capitalism or whatever. Uh, they couldn't integrate that. And I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I really like the agriculture horticulture example. Um, like just if you think about the way we produce food today. Um, yeah. Uh, from like meat, to like the, the meat plantation things in, in California. I don't know if anybody's ever driven through those because it's like they're on both sides of the road and there's just like these cows in a field of dirt. Um, and it's just like brown, the whole, it's all just brown. Um, and it's just, it's just so much different than uh, like a cow wandering in a meadow for for food, not that like that can't be made rigid because it definitely can. Um, so I, like I've been paying a lot of attention to like the G7 summit that just happened and trade between Canada and the US because I'm Canadian and I live in the States. Um, the, I think it's really interesting to think about the difference between farming in Canada and farming in the States because Canada has actually produced like this rigid model of farming that allows it to have sort of that older system. Uh, it, it's appropriated the older system of farming within like this very rigid structure uh, with the quota system. So uh, everything is much more heav heavily regulated within the Canadian farming system. But as a result, you have a whole bunch of smaller farm farmers, whereas in the US you have uh, these giant farms, which can't even be called farms anymore. They're factories for producing food. Um, but you have that that's occurred because of this more open system, right? Uh, where there is more freedom for the farmers. Uh, but as a result, you get this massive monopoly. Whereas in Canada, where you had this much more rigid structure, um, it remains uh, with smaller farms, smaller family-owned farms. Um, so it's, it's just an interesting way of how these concepts interact and intersect with one another. You mentioned the G7 and um, me being uh, a lover of conspiracy. Uh, I, I w I've just been thinking about how um, obviously, like at the beginning, they're talking about the magician king and the juris priest as the two poles of the state. And then, of course, in the middle, you have this war machine. And so I was thinking about, like, what are the two poles of, I guess, the American state? And I'm thinking, yeah, the juris priest are, like, obviously members of the church and cabinet or whatever. What do we call our government? Congress? Um, but 
on the other side, I guess you have like your despot uh, this time being Trump. Um, and so I was thinking, what is the war machine and how is it functioning in there? And I, I'm, I'm really big recently on uh, intelligence agencies and like state secrecy um, and how those function. Uh, like you, you have a state, but this, these intelligence agencies function below the state or, or not below it. Like there's a, I'm not going to go on this rant, but um, <laughs> I, I just thinking about where that war is and where it's coming from. Um, if, if, if the state is not going to war nowadays, if, you know, the police are obviously concerned with putting their boots on people and the government, the military is out waging war somewhere, what is the thing that's actually doing the war making? Did, did you get to the end of the chapter? I unfortunately didn't. Oh, okay. Um, well, I would, I would recommend reading to the end of the chapter. Okay. Um, no, no, just because, uh, so what happens is they talk about uh, the appropriation of the war machine, right, by the state. Um, but they suggest that there's like two outcomes of this. And the first is that the war machine just turns towards destruction and that's the fascist state, um, which is described in the micropolitics and segmentary plateau. But the other option, uh, what ha it's, it's this post-fascist move and um, it's where total war uh, becomes a part of just everyday lived experience um, under what Foucault called biopower. I don't think they use the term biopower in, in here, but uh, essentially what they're arguing for is biopower or what Deleuze calls is the society of control. Yeah. And this is, this is like the war machine is adopted in such a way that peace becomes its object. Um, and so the form of control is no longer like this disciplinary apparatus, which fights uh, to discipline people, but it's to control for peace, um, which is, I, I very much read it as biopower, or the society of control. Uh, so it's this post-fascist means of the war machine where the war machine um, Virilio talks about this a lot as well. Um, this internalization of war as a means for peace, total total defense or total peace, where there's still like there's tons of violence, but it's violence in the name of peace. So stuff like the Patriot Act. <laughs> yeah. May, may I just uh, change back to subject uh, of the examples? You said about the examples. One of the, the main examples in this plateau or in this text is coming later and it's about the, the blacksmith. And I think it's a, a very important thing uh, because it, it, it's written with his, his terminology is quite exact what, what he talks about because there is there is like we try to find example either then of the state or of the, the nomad but is there somehow something that is that is both at the same time and then it says that the, the smith uh, live in the, the strident space nor the smooth nor the strident space of the nomad but somehow inhabits both and you, you you said you know like you you want to read the, the whole uh, text as the middle <laughs> like mm -hmm. like what can inhabit both and then here he is he, quite explicit that that uh, even like the the the, uh, the metallurgy is like the another way of describing consciousness, I think, is, is very exact about the, 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 the connection between metallurgy and consciousness. So I don't know what you, what you think about the whole 
blacksmith part, and I don't mean like, you know, the practicality maybe of the blacksmith, but of this figure inhabiting both realms, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the the figure of this blacksmith could be could be a clue as to what the sort of affirmative deterritorialization could look like. Um, like I think that there's danger there, but there's also like a potential there um, to be selective from both plat from both the striated space and the smooth space. Because I don't like, we, we need to be clear that creating a smooth space is never the goal. Um, because that that's just destruction. That's just complete and pure destruction. Um, something is always going to be striated after the making it smooth. Um, and so just the pure creation of smooth space, like uh, on the, I don't know when we're going to read it, but the on the last line of the fourteenth plateau suggests that, like, never, never believe that a smooth space will suffice to save us. So the goal is not really to become a nomad. Maybe the goal is to become a blacksmith. Yeah, that's that's exactly how, how I I read it. That that you somehow you should not idealize the nomad here. And rather, and maybe not the, the the state either, but somehow, and I, I really love how he describes what the blacksmith does. And that is that like metals is something that exists in all, on, in, all around nature. You know, you have aluminum in your soils and you have, you have, you have, you have this, this metal is something that exists in everything. We eat metals, you know, you have iron in, in, in in your food, you have to eat iron to be able to to live. So somehow it's everywhere. But he, the blacksmith, and therefore the, the, the therefore the metal in itself is this smooth space that is covering the whole the whole the whole universe. But the blacksmith is following this flow somehow. He's he's, he's following the ore, and when he finds it, he says that. He makes something out of it, and that is, he makes he makes coins and weapons. That is what is used in the empires. So he's the he's the, the middle middle man. You cannot have the empire without the blacksmith, and but but to be able to 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 find the metals, you have to live in this smooth space. So he he gets you know like. We have talked about this line of flight, so this middle part, and therefore the blacksmith is the one that keeps it all together because he's able to inhabit the both. So you need to have this 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 figure to have it all to connect connect it all, I think. Mm -hmm. I um I have to admit that I uh, the other day I I was in Brooklyn for a party, left my copy of A Thousand Plateaus there. So I have been without it for a few days. So I didn't, I didn't read the whole thing, um, but I just want to riff on what you were just saying, Simon, um, just because I like that image. And uh, I'll admit, I didn't get to that part in the text, <laughs> but I like this idea of the blacksmith as a sort of uh, liminal figure, right? Between deterritorialization and territorialization, there's a sort of, as you, as you suggest, there's a, there's a movement of flows and then um, a sort of constructive aspect, right? Where there's a technology being produced of some kind or another on the other end, and that can be sort of pointed in different directions politically or whatever the case may be. And it makes me think of, uh, maybe it's not, maybe it's a, maybe this isn't appropriate to draw an analogy here, but the, the lobster god, right? Who has the double pinch, the double pincer and is deterritorializing with one with one side and re-territorializing on the other side, smoothing on one hand and 
uh, striating on the striating. How do you say that word? I don't have no idea. <laughs> on the other side, and so there's a sort of zippering effect of 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 um, uh, flows becoming uh, flows of if we use pick up on the or analogy, kind of like hardening and becoming. I don't know, something. <laughs> so I'm just drawing an analogy there. I like it. Um, also on the, I guess, the topic of the metallurgist, um, this makes me think like of the metallurgist being the synthesis of, um, uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't use synthesis, but you know, uh, this middle ground between maybe a royal science and a no man science. Um, in, in the case of metallurgy, I guess, you have like forging the, the factory form and in, in, on this side you have like the, um, the alchemical tradition of metallurgy. Um, and so the blacksmith like is both this person who's capable of making alloys and capable of finding things, but there's also a use for it. Um, like the alchemist is just trying to make the philosopher's stone and if he read the books close enough knows that he can never do that. Um, and you know, the, the, the industrial uh, forger is, you know, making girders for buildings. And so uh, th this, this question, this makes me think I, of a, what we've been talking about with a positive uh, deterritorialization, like finding that thing that is beyond it. Um, this alchemy analogy, um, it makes me think of like the, the project of the Russian cosmists, like to sort of resurrect all of the dead, to make this society where death is now abolished, um, where these institutions take on this ancestral quality as a product of um, the, the, the resurrection, which is also a revolution. Um, and I don't know exactly, like, I'm sorry. I've, my thoughts aren't really prepared on this, but um, this, this question of positive deterritorialization Makes me think and I think, and I think one important thing, and he actually uses the words too, is is uh, in metallurgy, it's uh, it's about the concept of transformation. And here it's kind of what we've been into a little bit, like this whole. Maybe the question here is not like how. The question is not how, where how to disrupt the state with nomadicness, but but rather a much more ontological or like existential thing that is like, how is transformation possible at all? Like what is transformation and which, how do you place yourself in such circumstances that makes transformation possible? And that's the blacksmith because blacksmith metallurgy is transformation. And if this is, also an analogy or, or, or an image of thinking or of the mind, then it begets like this, this concept of how is the transformation of the mind possible? Like, can you reach, can you reach beyond where you are today? How do you, how do you, how do you resurrect yourself or how, what, what is like, and I think that's a very close to what he's actually is pointing to is this, that's the positive project. It's not, and it, it's not like giving you an answer, but saying this is where you should be for transformation to be able to. Yeah. We have about ten more minutes. Um, so, if there's anything like Dave, if you have a question that you really wanted to get to, or if anybody has anything that they really want to bring up. Um, now would be a good time, and then we could discuss it for the next uh, seven or eight minutes. If nobody has anything, I have something. Um, 
uh, but I can't remember the page number for it. It had to do with arithmetic. So there was two uh, aspects of the nomad, and I really didn't understand. So there's the spatio-geographic, so they create a smooth space. It's affective, um, so the war machine is an affective force. But it also has an arithmetic uh, aspect, which is, I was super lost in terms of that. And I'll try to find it in the text, but I don't know if anybody knows too much about math. Um, or about, or paid attention to that, but. I wonder if this kind of is something that's resonating with uh, the con the that distinction or or yeah the differences between royal science and uh, and nomad science right but in a more in a very particular example of that um, so for example like in physics. Uh, if you're going to kind of uh, calculate a vector, right? You need to sort of superimpose a transcendent field of some kind, right? So you, you, gra you basically lay a graph over reality in a sense, and then you kind of plot points. And that I think can be uh, sort of described as a way that the way that royal science works. And I think that applies to the, the other examples of bridge making and that sort of thing that he gives. Um, but there is, and I'm not completely familiar with this, but there is a way of kind of plotting those points in an imminent framework so that the information that you would use is already contained kind of, it, it comes out of the middle. And I'm, I'm not sort of, <laughs> qualified enough to kind of give a full explanation of that. But um, I heard, uh, is it Delamanda, that guy, give an account of this like a, like a while back. And it was really, it was really clear. Um, hopefully I got some of that through there. So I think a page number might be 388 if anybody wants to... read or, or find, see it in the book, but the claim is that um, the nomos or nomos, I don't know how to say that. Uh, also, we have five minutes left. That's um, like the custom, right? The, cust the uh, customary rule or whatever? Uh, yeah, so part of what, uh, part of the distinction between the nomad and the the state is that the state is polis and the nomad is nomos. Thank you. Um, so they suggest that the nomos, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to screw it up no matter what. The nomos is uh, fundamentally numerical or arithmetic. Um, and they contrast Greek geometry with Arab uh, arithmetic. Um, and this is, I, I'm just super lost in, in terms of this, but I don't know. I understood the other two principles of the nomad, but this one, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I would say quickly that you have this concept in algebra or in that the concept of infinite somehow the the, the possibility of a, of a line and i think he's trying to say also that the, the greek geometry is somehow always trying to to uh, capture but there is this and i i think you also maybe would say that, like this is the the infinitesimal calculus is in nomadic science because there yeah there you have the possibility of going be, going to the infinite, uh, a, a concept uh, 
that the geometry is trying to, to pull, pull, don't want to grasp with the infinite, but rather the finite forms and how they are placed together. But the, the nomad has the infinite, that's, it's, it's, it's closer to, to them because they are not like, they have this bounding, I would say. Okay. I, I just read something in here. Um, that I think helps me a little bit, they say, but on the other hand, uh, so in the nomad space, uh, there's a shift towards like, I, I think I can think about it in terms of the shift towards biopower um, or the shift from individual to individual uh, where th people just become numbers in an algorithm. Um, there's a shift from having the strict striations between individual identities towards just uh, you are a number within a system that statistically will do something. Uh, does anybody have any closing thoughts? We really have to wrap it up. Nope. Unless Dave, are you trying to say something? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be I'll be interested in in this like this kind of question uh, throughout all of this. Examples of how people use concepts being developed um, are here are always useful, and yeah, I I I just I I don't. I just don't know how this different this distinction between word machine and state helps me think about states. Um, that's all. I think yeah. I think the purpose is like thinking through how how to dismantle the state. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's well, a good... if we knew that, <laughs> yeah, it's just well, interesting. That's that, to out. <laughs> right? Exactly. It's just weird that, like, okay, yeah. Well, and mm. there's a part there where he says the state. Uh, he's draw. I, I don't know if you'd call it a genealogy or, or 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 a history, maybe or something, but that the state, um, you know, is, is sort of inextricable like there's there's no sort of passing from the um like from the from the from the from the from the nomadic to the state right so the, they conclude that the state always was so i think that the the con the idea or the goal of dismantling the state i think maybe isn't isn't really a great one if that's if you kind of follow their thinking out at least I didn't realize that that they said that. That's really interesting. I think it was always there as a virtual, right? It, it was always there virtually. It wasn't there in actuality. Um, I think they think the state was always there in actuality. I think okay. they say more about that in Anti Oedipus. Um, okay. Because for them, they're like as far back as we have any sort of historical record. There's always been a state. Um, so well, that would because make the state sense. because the, the state creates the historical record. Um, right. Hmm. I think they say more about it in anti Oedipus, though. I think this is useful for just kind of thinking through um, the relationship to the state as it, you know, uh, from with a view to particular uh, flows, particular nomadic structures, systems, what have you. So you could kind of think about various movements, you know, political movements, um, uh, relationships, um, yeah, to the state. So like maybe the, the church or something like this. Um, yeah. How that sort of like, <laughs> what the benefit of that <laughs> Is is I think a, like a bigger question, but I think it is kind of potentially useful for thinking again those relationships. Okay.
so we should cut it off there. Um, who's going we'll, next week? Yeah, who wants to who wants to ask questions next week? We will be we reading for sure uh, Plateau Thirteen, where we will continue this um, as Thirteenth. I vote Plateau, Simon. Twelfth Plateau, and I just have to look up what else we're reading. One sec. Um, I can do the questions if you want. Awesome. Uh, and then I just have to find it. We will also be reading, uh, ooh, we're, we have two really fun ones next week. We also get to read How to Make Yourself a Body Without Organs, which goes in a little bit of a different direction, but uh, I think it'll be fun. Okay, thanks everybody. So same time next week, and we'll see you all there. Thanks, guys. I'll Bye. see you all, thanks for and I'll be on today. shrooms because, <laughs> because I'll be a body without organs. That'll be fun. Bye.